today we're going to start this new series called The Art of Neighboring, and we're going to look at um, like, what is our response to that love? What is our response to the love that God has for us? And in John chapter 14, verse 15, Jesus says this, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. So what is our response to God's love? If we love him, we'll keep his commandments. There's two ways of seeing the commandments. You can see them literally or you could see them figuratively, right? You could see them like Jesus said to do this, and so he means exactly what it says on the page. Or he's giving an example, and that example is like a metaphor of how we should actually live. So the, the difference is, is like literally is where things mean exactly what they say. Figuratively is like a deeper spiritualized meaning where things that are covered, uh, they're like covered in a metaphor, and they don't necessarily mean exactly what they say. An example of figurative, uh, figurative command will be in Matthew chapter 5, verse 29. Jesus says this, If your right eye causes you to sin, Tear it out, throw it away, for it's better for you to lose one of your members than for the whole body to be thrown into hell, right? Is Jesus really saying, hey, believers, you know, if you've ever made a mistake with like looking at something or you've said the wrong thing or whatever, like your eye causes you sin, like go ahead and just pluck it out. Is he literally meaning that? No, but what he's saying is, is like get in your mind that, hey, whatever I've got to do to stop sinning, do that. So it was a figurative thing. But then there's literal commands where he tells us to do something very specific, There's these two examples. If I go and tell my kids to clean their room, the literal meaning would be go now and clean your room, right? Parents, have you ever done that? Kids, go clean your room. That's the literal meaning. What does it mean? Pick up all your clothes, pick up all your toys, put them where they belong, take out the trash, put it in the can, all the cups that you have. This is like my kid's room. I'm probably just kind of, this is my therapy, guys, so just let me do this. Um, No, I'm just kidding. Uh, So, like, just go do it, and so on. But Liz and I are just like every other parent, and giving my kids the benefit of the doubt, sometimes I think that they take my literal commands figuratively. Go clean your room. It could be like, you know, hey, go live your best life. You know, that's, that's like what I'm like trying to tell them. Like, just go, just go do whatever. You know, I really want you to relax. So get your room just to the right level of squalor that you can handle, and then outside of that, just relax. You know, no, that's not what go clean your room means. And so we understand that they're literal commands of Jesus and they're figurative commands of Jesus. In May of 2014, Navy Admiral William H. McRaven was invited to give the commencement speech at the graduation ceremony at the University of Texas. And the main point of his speech was centered around the training that he got when he was a Navy SEAL younger in his career. The main point, and he's talking to all these graduates, and I don't know if you know much about the University of Texas, very, very difficult to get into. It's a very elite school in our country. And, and so, like, he's talking to these people who are engineering graduates and biomedical graduates and all these people that just have, like, these really, really crazy, like, degrees that they're going into. And so this Navy SEAL admiral uh, gets up and he talks about this training. And the training wasn't, uh, that he was talking about wasn't the most advanced battle tactics or weaponry or personal feats or anything that you would associate with what we would think of or what Navy SEALs would be trained in. That's not what Admiral McRaven decided that he was going to talk about. No, what he talked about was the training that he got in Navy skills, SEAL school about how to make his bed. How to make his bed every morning. He spoke the most prestigious universities in the United States about making his bed. And this is what he said. He said, it was a simple task, mundane at best, but every morning we were required to make our bed to perfection. It seemed the the most ridiculous thing at the time, partly in light of the fact that we were aspiring to be real warriors, tough, hardened seals. But the wisdom of the simple act has been proven to me many times over. If you make your bed every morning, you will have accomplished the first task of the day. It will uh, give you a sense of pride and it will encourage you to do another task and then another and then another. By the end of the day, that one simple task will have turned into many completed tasks. Making your bed will reinforce the fact that the little things in life matter. If you can't do the little things right, you'll never do the big things right. And if by chance you had a miserable day, You will come home to a bed that is made, that you made, and the made bed will give you encouragement that tomorrow will be better. If you want to change the world, start off by making your bed. How many of you guys in this room are bed makers? How many of you guys are like, I slept in it, I'm going to sleep in it tomorrow, it's just going to be the same thing, you know, like we have the two things. And so this idea of, hey, let's just do the simple things well. 
Let's just take the most simple things that Jesus said. Let's just take these ideas and just do the simplest of things well. The seal instructors weren't about weren't talking about making a figurative bed. No, they he had to actually do it. He had to actually meet the high standards. He actually had to like do that. And, and, and he thought that it was tedious, but he realized that it eventually it took on deeper meaning and he was able to do more things with the idea. When we look at the commands of Jesus, we must first obey them literally before moving on to the figurative. So we got to look at the most basic commands that Jesus has, the most basic commands that he gives us. And we got to say, okay, I, I got I to gotta do this. I got to obey this. I got I to gotta, I gotta do what he says here. And so if Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commands, then what are the commands? We know about the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20. Don't steal, don't kill, uh, don't commit adultery, don't, you know, among other things, right? Among several other, the 10 there. We know about those, but Exodus, Leviticus, and Deuteronomy are full of commandments. In fact, there are 613 commandments in all, ranging from do not kill to when you're cooking a lamb, don't boil it in its own mother's milk. That's actually in Deuteronomy 14, verse 21, if you want to look it up, all right? That's actually there. It's a command that, G, that God gave the children of Israel. Now, if we have 613 commands, that's really, really hard to keep up with. I don't know about you guys, but ever since like they actually like had contacts on my phone, I don't memorize numbers anymore. Like I still remember like my home phone number when I was a little kid, you know, the ones that your parents like drill into you. But now I don't know anybody's number. And that's only seven digits. That's only seven numbers that I have to know, like in order for me to be able to call someone. But I don't know that. I just dial them up in my phone, pull them up in the contacts, and I, and I go for it. How in the world are we to remember 613 commands, much less obey them? And in Jesus' time, different teachers came along. These teachers were called rabbis, and they emphasized one command over another. They said, hey, these, these are ones that are like really important. You got to make sure you do these. These are the ones are, you know, we want you to do these, but if you don't, you know, it's okay, whatever. You know, what are the big things? What are the big commands that we're supposed to do? And so when we look at this passage that we're going to look at today in Matthew chapter 22, we understand where the question is coming from. The guy asked Jesus, hey, what are the biggest commands that you have? Jesus, I, I see that you're a rabbi. I see that you're a teacher. I see that you're, you're trying to instruct people on how to live God's way. I see you doing these things. What are the things that we should focus on? Out of these 613, all these things that we were trying to hold up and all these things we're trying to do to honor God, all these things we're trying to do to show that we love you, what are the two things, Jesus, that we need, or what are the things that we need to do? What's the, what's the greatest one? And in Matthew chapter 22, verse 36, the question is asked, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And he said to him, this is Jesus. Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Basically, everything that you are, love God. Don't compartmentalize. Don't say, hey, this is my church self. This is my work self. This is my home self. Like just everything you are, love God, worship God. You are to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the greatest in the first commandment. And then he says this, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all of the law and the prophecies, love uh, the prophets, love the God with everything that you are, and love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus says that those two things, all 613 of those commandments roll up into that. They roll up into that. And so when we, for the Christian, these are our make your bed commands, right? These are the most basic commands that we have to follow. These are like, hey, if I'm just gonna, if I'm gonna do something simple today, if I'm just going to say, you know, today there's a lot of stuff going on and there's a lot of things that I'm struggling with, but if I'm just going to obey God in two areas today, in two simple areas today, what are those two going to be? And that's what Jesus says. These are, these are our make your bed commandments. Love God with everything that you are and love your neighbor as yourself. The problem is that many of us, and I'm guilty of this as well, many of us take these commandments figuratively especially the second one, love your neighbor as yourself. I agree with the concept of loving your neighbor. So I hold the door open for the lady at the Circle K. I, uh, I, I uh, let people with two items at the grocery store line jump ahead of me when I've got a cart full. I do that. That's loving my neighbor, right? Like I do all these things. I, 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 I tip my barista at Starbucks. Like I, I, I'm a nice guy, right? Is that really loving my neighbor? 
Is that really what, is it all, did, did I just do some nice things for people? How literally do I take the second and most important commandment to Jesus, that, that Jesus gave? A few years ago, the city of Denver, Colorado, came out with a study, and they found out that people who had close bonds with their immediate neighbors— right? This is not the people that you run into Starbucks. This is not the people that you, that, you, uh, that you pass on the street. This is not the people that you wave at and you have no idea where they live in your neighborhood. But this is like your immediate neighbors, like the people that live right across the street, next door to you, behind you. They found that people who have close bonds with their immediate neighbors live longer. When people know the names of their neighbors, crime is 60% lower in that community and there's no visible difference. This is, the, this is the most important thing that I want you to hear as a Christian today. There's no visible difference that the study found between how Christians acted with their neighbors and how non-Christians acted with their neighbors. The most important command Jesus gave us was to love God with everything they are. The second most important thing he says is to love your neighbor as yourself. And the city of Denver, Colorado found that there was no difference between how Christians and non-Christians acted. We have to love our neighbors. We have to take this idea that, 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 that Jesus gave us, this command that Jesus gave us to love our neighbor as ourselves. We have to take it literally. How does Jesus then define neighbors? Is it ideology? Do they think like me? Is it, is it race? Do they look like me? Is it morals? Do they act like me? The, this question was actually brought up to him in Luke chapter 10. And, and let's read that. Luke chapter 10, verse 28. And it said this, behold, a lawyer, it's always a lawyer, behold, a lawyer stood up and put him to the test. I have really good friends that are lawyers, so if anybody's watching on video, I don't really mean that. Um, A lawyer stood up and put him to the test saying, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said, what is written in the law? How do you read it? Like, how do you read the law? You know, this is what, if if you're asking me, what do you need to do? What are the commandments that you need to follow? How do you read that? And the, the, the guy answered him. He said, he said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. Does that sound familiar? This is the command that Jesus, he, he's, he's talking Jesus' language. He's saying the things back to Jesus the way that need to be said. And he said to him, Jesus said to him, you've answered correctly. Do this and you will live. He gave the correct answer. But the guy needed, to cl- needed some clarity. And so this is how it plays out in Luke uh, verse 10, verse 29. But he said, and then uh, Luke gives this nice little uh, caveat here. But he said, desiring to justify himself. Sometimes you just got to, you know, like just, just take it for what it is. But desiring to justify himself, he said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? And then Jesus replied to him with a story. And now you've probably heard the story before, but I just want to look at it today. Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. And he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now, by chance, a priest was going down the road. And when he saw him, he passed on the other side. Now, priests of the day were pastors and ministers, those who had full-time employment to minister the, 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 the God's word to the people. A priest saw this man who had been beaten, who had been robbed, who had been left for dead, and he passed on the other side of the road. So likewise, a Levite, Jesus continues, when he came to the place where he saw him, he passed on the other side. Levites were religious people. They were descendants of of Levi. They were of the tribe of Levi. And their job was to serve alongside the priests in in the temple. So these were like the most church people that you could think of, right? So you got all your pastors and all your church people right? And when Jesus is telling the story, Jesus is saying that this guy was beaten. He was robbed. And all the pastors and all the church people came walking down the road and they passed by the guy and they walked on the other side of the road. That's where, the, where Jesus is talking. But then he says, he continues, but a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was and he saw him and he had compassion. 
one of the key commandments in Judaism, when you're looking at, you know, again, the original question that this guy asked was, what commandment should I obey? What is the biggest commandment that I need to follow? One of the key commandments of Judaism is that they were to not marry outside of their faith. That also means race. They were all supposed to worship in the temple in Jerusalem, but Samaritans were descendants of the northern tribes of Israel who had been conquered by the Assyrians. And what they did when the Assyrians conquered them, they intermarried. They were labeled as rebels and half-breeds by the Jews. When the Jews returned from exile in Babylon, this is all in Ezra and Nehemiah, all those books in the Bible, when they returned from their exile after the Babylonians conquered them, the, they, the Samaritans actually came to the Jews and they said, hey, we'll help you guys rebuild the temple. Do you want us to do that? And the Jews said, absolutely not. We don't want you to do that. And so if you actually read in Nehemiah, the, the Samaritans offered help and then they actively opposed uh, the Jews for, for building the temple once the Jews rejected them. So these are, this is kind of the dynamic between the Jews and the Samaritans. These are people that just weren't liked. And so you have the church people and the pastors who walked along the other side of the road from this, the, this man who was beaten and he was robbed. But then you got people that no one liked who thought that at the base level that they just weren't, they, they, they really just weren't good people because of who they were. In fact, if you read in John chapter 8, verse 48, people accuse Jesus of being both demon-possessed and a Samaritan, right? Like that's kind of how, you know, the, 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 the Samaritans were viewed. And so Jesus, when he's telling this story, he's choosing these characters and he's saying, he's saying, I mean, it's a figurative story. It's, it's an example. It's a metaphor. It's, 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 it's an idea. And he's saying that sometimes there's going to be church people. There's going to be pastors like me. There's going to be religious people. And when they see someone who is broken and who is hurting and who is beaten and who is lost and who is robbed, they pass by the other side. And sometimes there's a Samaritan that comes along and he has compassion on them. He continues the story. He went up to him, the Samaritan, this is Luke chapter 10, verse 34. He went up to him, he bound his wounds up, pouring on the oil and the wine. Oddly enough, oil and wine were used by the priests and the Levites as aspects of worship. So the things that people use for their worship, the Samaritan used to heal this man that was on the side of the road. Just a side note, you can put that in your pocket for later. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii, which was uh, money at the time, and gave it to the innkeeper saying, take care of him and whenever you spend, uh, whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Then Jesus asked, which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? And he said, the one who showed mercy to him. And Jesus said, you go and do likewise. To Jesus, a neighbor isn't based on your ideology. Someone who thinks like you. It's not based on race. Someone who looks like you. It's not based on morals. Someone who acts like you. To Jesus, a neighbor is based on proximity. Someone who is near you. Someone who is near you. I believe that God placed you where you're at in your neighborhood, in your work, in your school, wherever it is, he placed you there for a reason. It wasn't because you found a good house that you could afford. It wasn't because this is just where your realtor took you. God placed you there. I believe God knew the people that were going to be there or who would be there uh, and knew the light that he placed inside of you and how that could benefit them. And so if the commandment is to love our neighbor and we're going to take this commandment literally, how well do, are we doing loving those near to us? As I was pre preparing this message, in my mind, I have a couple with two kids, two little kids, probably five and three, live right across the street from me. I've met them once. I don't remember their name. I mean, you guys are like that. Just be honest. There's someone that lives around me. I don't know their name. I don't know their name. So if I'm, I'm to love the neighbors, and we're just going to take this command at face value, the people that are living around me, the people that are doing the things that I'm doing, people that I run into all the time in my neighborhood, if I'm going to take it at face value, I mean, I need to love them. Learning my neighbor's names would be a great first step. And again, I'm preaching to me. I'm preaching to me. It moves you from, hey, man, to, hey, Mike, 
You know, it moves you from that, right? And, and, and what the, the progress that could happen is like this. So originally, I don't know. So I'm like, hey, man. And then I'm like, hey, Mike. And then I'm like, hey, Mike, how you doing? And then I'm like, hey, Mike, I'm working on something in my garage. Can you come over and, and look at this with me? And then I say, hey, Mike, I saw that your son moved back in or your daughter moved back in. You know what? Uh, what's going on? Is there anything I can do to help? Do you see how that progression works? But I can't say, hey, man, I saw that your kid moved back in. Is there anything I can do? <laughs> like, that would be weird right? And so we have to like practically like just take the first step to be good neighbors. And for some of us, this comes more naturally than others. Like for me, not natural. Like for me, it's garage door up, truck pulls in, garage door down, I'm done for the day, right? That's how it is, right? But is that being a good neighbor? Am I taking the command of Jesus at face value? No, I'm not right? We've got to be good neighbors. So here's what I did. We're just going to take a first step, right? First step. And, and some of you guys will crush this. You got, I, got, I got a slide of this. You can go ahead and put it up so everybody can see it. Um, some of you guys will crush this. And some of you guys, like you got some homework to do, right? This is uh, who's my neighbor card, right? So I'm going to give you guys this, just one per family. You don't really need a ton. How many of you guys right now, just go ahead and pass it around. How many of you guys right now so if, like, this is my house, I'm in the middle, right? The one that's uh, above, right, that's my neighbor across the street. The one that's below is my neighbor behind me. And then you can kind of fill out the grid next door neighbor to the left, next door neighbor to the right. How many of you guys could just fill out the names of those people, like, right now? Three of you, four of you, right? Eh, eh, a little bit, Yeah. A little bit. So for the most of part, and guys, this is not something where like I'm really trying to beat us up. Like this is cultural. This is like normal. Like this is like part of the society that we live in. And we as Christians, we've just like kind of become this, right? We, we're just part, we're just based on like how we are in the culture that we're around. And so like, just like I speak English, I don't speak Hebrew. That was the language of the Bible. I don't speak that anymore. I speak English because that's the culture I live in. That's the, the, the stuff I know. I do a 40-hour work week at work. That's the culture I live in. That's the, cult, that's the stuff I know. And so for many of us, the culture that we live in, we don't neighbor well. We don't neighbor well. And so we, we, we've got to do this. And so the project that I want to give you guys is try to fill this out. If you can fill it out, just put it on your fridge. These people you can pray for, right? If you can't fill it out, then you've got work to do. You got work to do. And it could be, and this is always an awkward conversation. And trust me, I was a, I was a youth pastor. We used to have a youth group. What was it? How was a youth group? About 200 kids, right? And you have 200 kids, and someone would come like once every two months or whatever. And like, I was terrible at remembering names. Like, I would actually have like one of my interns stand beside me. And if I didn't say a kid's name in like 20 seconds, like he would introduce himself so I would know the kid's name, right? So it wouldn't sound like, oh, Pastor Jeff didn't know my name, you know? Like, that's how it would be. Terrible at names, right? And so you're going to have an awkward conversation. Man, we've been living next door to each other for eight years now, and I don't know your name. That's a really weird conversation to have. Can we all agree to that, right? But is it good that we continue not knowing the names of our neighbors? Is that good? No. And so we start with just simply knowing their names, right? So this is like step one. Like this is base level. Like I'm not asking you to... um, you know, Jesus says, um, you know, the, the, best, the best way to show love or the, the way that we show love is when we lay down our life for our friends, right? So I'm not asking you, like, to take a bullet for your neighbor that you don't even know your name yet, right? I'm not asking you to. I'm saying let's just take a baby step. So here's what we're going to do. Go ahead, and um, when you take this card home, fill out the neighbors that you have around us. And if you don't know who that person is, make some cookies, do something, and just say, hey, We've lived across the street for X many years. I know that I see you. I see you leaving, all this stuff. I just wanted to make sure I know your name. Make sure you write the name down so you don't forget it again, right? And then, then you got somebody that you can pray for. The other thing that's going to help you is every time that you see them from there on out, say their name. Hey, Mike. You know, say their name every time. Don't go back to hey, man, even though now I've got their name. Go ahead and say their name because then the idea eventually is that you don't need this card, right? You don't need this card. This sounds super practical, I know, way more practical than I typically preach. But, guys, we got to start somewhere. 
we got to start somewhere. we got to start moving beyond just the garage door closing and us being inside of our fortress. And we got to get into the lives of the people that God placed around us. Some of us are naturally better at this than others. Some, some of us, um, you know, we take this command literally. Some of us, we, um, we grew up in a Mayberry-like town, and everybody knows everybody, and you always you run across the street and borrow sugar. That's just not how it is anymore. And again, this is not for you to feel guilty. This is for you to just realize, hey, this is the culture I live in, but I need to be different than my culture. I got to be different. I got to do something different. I got I to gotta, I gotta get outside of myself. We live in a culture that's more connected than ever before through the devices in our pockets. I literally right now can take out this device and FaceTime my friend who's a missionary in Thailand. Like I literally can see his face. Like, and we can talk to one another. He's sitting in Thailand. I'm sitting here in Arizona, and we can face-to-face talk to each other. We're more connected than ever before. However, we live in one of the most lonely cultures than ever before. A recent study by a major U.S. health insurance company found that only half of Americans, 53%, listen to this, 53% of Americans say that they have meaningful daily face-to-face social interactions, including extended conversations with a friend or spending quality time with family. 53%. And yet, I can pull my device out and talk to someone face-to-face across the globe. It's insane, guys. We've got to do better. We have to be the ones that are different. We have to be the ones who are, who are making a difference in our world. We have to be the ones who, who, who are showing the gospel, who are showing Jesus' love to the people that are around us. And so my challenge to you as we, we start this series, as we're doing this series, again, some of you guys might be like, man, that's basic. Like, I've done this way before. Some of you guys may be like, I don't know anybody that lives around me. Like, I know what they look like, but I don't know their names. I don't know their kids' names. I don't know anything. So we have to take the first step because I don't know about you, but I love God. I love Jesus and I'm thankful for what he's done in my life. I'm thankful for what he's done in my kid's life and my family's life. I'm thankful for that. And I want to take the first step in just obeying his commands. I want to obey him. I want to follow him. I want to say, Jesus, whoever you put around me, I want to love them like you love me. Can I pray for you? Heavenly Father, I thank you for each and every person in this room. God, I pray, Lord, that each of us would take the command seriously. That we would love you. We would love you by obedience. Lord, we thank you for what you've done for us. We thank you for the, the, the sacrifice that you made for us. And God, I know right now that there are people that live around us that need to be loved, need to be cared for, need to have someone reach out to them, need to have someone show that they care and that, 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 that they're not just um, some annoyance that we live around. But God, there's someone who is loved and cared for deeply by um, their creator. And so, Father, I pray that it starts in us. God, I repent of my own um, selfishness or laziness. I don't don't even know what it is. God, I feel like it was so so ingrained in our culture. We don't even know what to call it. God, I repent of that. Lord, help us be good neighbors. Help us love the people that are around us. In Jesus' name.